three dividend paying stocks that everybody needs in their portfolio in 2023. Number one is Starbucks. Everyone needs their morning cup of coffee. New administration is being trained. Plus, Starbucks is opening 3,000 locations in China alone over the next few years. Number two is UPS. It's the age of e-commerce. Post-pandemic, we've seen e-commerce sales surge year after year, and they're not planning on slowing down anytime soon. And the first stock is going to be Disney or ticker symbol DIS. Disney basically owns half of the media businesses in the world. It has ESPN, Marvel, Star Wars, it has Hulu, it has live sports, and much, much more. Not only that, but they have parks around the world and they are going to be around for a very long time. And it's actually at a pretty good price right now. Let me convince you that everything you've just seen is completely wrong investment advice. It goes against everything that we know on how financial markets work. I've talked a lot about theory in the past lessons, but now we want to use that theory to solve the central question, how can we make money on a financial market? And how our strategy goes about critically depends on one question, what we think about market efficiency. And market efficiency is the question, if we have a financial asset, does the market form the correct price for that asset? And by correct price, I mean, does the market price reflect the return, risk, and time horizon of repayment of the asset? And for this course, we're going to simplify this question. You know that from theory, we have reason to believe that the market portfolio is an extremely good portfolio, that the market portfolio actually has the best trade of, of risk and return. And we can measure this risk return profile with the Sharpe ratio. Let me remind you, the Sharpe ratio is return of an asset minus the risk-free rate divided, the, divided by the volatility of the asset. And if we think that the market is efficient, that all assets are correctly priced, then we think that the market portfolio has the highest Sharpe ratio. So I want to reframe the question about market efficiency by asking, can we achieve a higher Sharpe ratio or higher risk return trade off than the market portfolio? And there are two ways to answer that question. Option one is we say no, the market portfolio has the highest Sharpe ratio. And if that is our answer to market efficiency, then investing becomes extremely easy. You know from previous lessons that if the market portfolio has the highest Sharpe ratio, then we just need to think about how much of our money to put into the market portfolio and how much our money to put into the riskless asset, right? That was Tobin's mutual fund theory. And if you ask me about investment advice, this is the answer you will always get. Me and most of my friends were definitely in team market efficiency. We, we definitely believe that as a single investor, the best thing you can do is just put your money into the market. I showed you the Eugene Pharma paper in the last lesson. He looked at 4,500 mutual fund managers in America, and he found that 97% of them are not able to get a better sharp ratio than the market. So there's very convincing evidence that this is actually a very, very solid investment strategy. But of course, you can also take the other direction. You can say, well, I believe not all assets are correctly priced. And I believe I can exploit that and I can get a better sharp ratio than the market. In other words, you can also be part of the team that says, yes, I can achieve a better sharp ratio than the market by investing differently, by not investing in the, into the market portfolio, but investing in a different portfolio. And let me show you what those people are trying to do. Let's say we have a financial asset and this asset has a certain risk associated with that. And this risk and the market price for that risk is 20% return. So we have a risk that demands a return of 20%. And that asset repays in one year. So if I put this on a timeline, we have, we have the repayment here. And we have today here. And if the price of that asset on the market is 100 euros, what does the market expect the repayment to be? 
Well, 120 euros, right? I told you the market price for the risk is 20%, so we expect a 20% return on an investment. But let's now say that this is a technology company and you know they launch a new product next year and you believe that it will go extremely well. And so you believe that the price or the value of that stock in a year will not be 120, it will be 150. So the fair price for that stock would actually be 125, right? Because 125 times 1.2 times our required return of 20%, that is 150. But there is a mispricing. The market only puts the price of the asset at 100. So if you're actually right, if it's true that the repayment for that stock will be 150, then you can trade, you can exploit the mispricing of the market because you buy that asset undervalued. You get 50% return, but take risk that is only worth 20% return. So on the risk return trader, you are winning against the market. But of course, it's extremely bold to claim that the market has mispriced an asset. Why? Think back about our supply and demand diagram. The price of an asset critically depends on the demand of the people in the market. And think about who sets the demand for assets. It's the big professionals. It's Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, the big funds, the big insurance people, because they demand 100,000 of stocks. They set the demand curve. It's not you. It, it doesn't matter if you demand one or five or 10 stocks. That won't change the demand at all. It's, it, it matters whether Bank of America demands 100,000 or 200,000 stocks for a certain price. So they are the people who set and move prices for financial assets. So if you say, I, I believe the price for a financial asset is wrong, you implicitly say, I believe that I have a better understanding of the market than JP Morgan, Bank of America and Goldman Sachs. It's an extremely bold claim. But people do this all the time. And one of the most popular ways to arrive at, this, at that claim, I believe the market has mispriced an asset, is what people mean by fundamental analysis. Let me show you an example of a guy who's doing exactly that. And the first stock is going to be Disney or ticker symbol DIS. Disney basically owns half of the media businesses in the world. Not only that, but they have parks around the world and they are going to be around for a very long time. Let me give you a very tangible example on why these strategies fail. We're going to go into sports betting. Let's say we have two teams, team one and team two. And there are two soccer teams and they're going against each other in the Champions League final. And let's say they're equally strong. So the odds of team one or team two winning are just 50-50. So if you go to a sports betting website now, what reward will you get for betting one dollar on either team one or team two winning? The odds will be exactly two for both teams. Why? Because what is your expected reward from investing one dollar in either team one or team two? Well, if you invest one dollar and team one wins, you get two dollars back. But the probability of team one winning is 50%. So you expect to make one dollar and a one dollar investment so your net result is zero and the same is true if you bet on team two right you get two dollars back but you have a 50 percent chance of team two winning so you will get one dollar back on average let's now say that team two has a very good player and he gets injured just two days before the champions league final so the odds change so what now happens is the probability of team one winning is 80 percent and the probability of team two winning is 20%. But now the quotes are going to change as well. What you will observe is that the reward for betting $1 on team one is going to be 1.25. And the reward for betting $1 on team two is going to be five. Why? Because the quotes react to the chances of the teams winning. With that new quotes, you once again have the same expected reward. For If you bet $1 on team one, well, you get $1.25 back, but the chance of team one winning is 80%, so you get on average $1. And if you bet $1 on team two, well, you get $5 if they win, but the chance of them winning is only 20%, so you get $1 as an expected reward. And you see what's happening here. The price perfectly reflects the future chances of either team winning. And if something happens, the price will adapt. And that's why it doesn't matter in sports betting which team you bet on. You have the same chances of winning either way. 
Let me give you a real life example to convince you that this is exactly how it works. So we're going into the 2019-2020 Premier League season and we're going to look at Manchester United. They were a really good team that season. They had Martial and Rashford on their team, if you know anything about soccer. And they, in the end, they came in third, so they did an extremely good season. And in this graph, you see the results for Manchester United. And I coded the wins as ones, so this is every time that Manchester United won. Minus one is Manchester United lost, and zero is they had a draw. So you see, obviously, Manchester United won more than they lost because, I mean, they came in third in the Premier League season. So what you could do now is you could do a sports betting strategy. You could say, okay, I know Manchester United is an extremely good team. They have extremely good players. So on every game that season, I'm going to bet $1 on Manchester United winning. And by the logic of fundamental analysis, you should make an extreme profit with that. Right? That's the same logic of people saying this is a great company, so I'm going to buy their stock. But see what happens. So once again, in gray, you have the wins and losses and draws of Manchester United. And in pink, you have your betting payoff. So every time Manchester United has a draw or loses, you get nothing. And every time Manchester United wins, you get your payoff. And what do you see? The payoff is most of the time pretty small. Why? Because everybody knows Manchester United is a good team. So you will not get a lot of money back from betting on Manchester United. And if you do the strategy, betting $1 in Manchester United in every game, you will actually make $36 in rewards. But of course, it's 38 games and you invest $1 every game, so you lose $38. So in the end, you lose $2 with that strategy, right? You're almost at zero. I mean, you're, you're almost at zero. Now to show you that the odds are kind of fair, I want to show you the results for an alternative strategy. Always betting against Manchester United. And in this graph, you once again have in gray whether Manchester United won or lost or had a draw. You see in pink the results for the strategy of betting for Manchester United. And in purple, you see the results for betting against Manchester United. And what do you see? Well, if you bet against Manchester United, you have very few gains. But if you have a gain, then this gain is extremely large. So the result for always betting against Manchester United in that season where they came in third is actually $39. And you know, because you invested $1 in every of the 38 games, you actually make $1. So this shows you it actually does not matter what you bet on. Why? Because the odds are fair. The odds accurately reflect the future. So no matter what you bet on, you will end up at about zero on average. And of course, because sports betting companies want to make money, they charge you fees. So you don't end up at zero on average, but you make losses on average. And the market also is incredibly good at pricing the risk for assets. In a market, the price will almost always reflect the risk of an asset. Let me hammer down that point again. If we have an asset that pays out 1,200 in a year and costs 1,000 in a year, right? Then the return is 20%, right? So let's now say that for some reason there's an earthquake in the area of that company that is operating in. So what, so what happens is that the expected repayment will drop to 120. What will happen to the price? The price will drop immediately to 100 to reflect the new assessment of the future repayment. Because the future repayment is 120, so to get that return of 20%, the market price has to be 100 today. Markets are extremely quick at incorporating new information and markets are extremely good at pricing assets correctly. And so now you could say, all right, Nico, you've told me that the market is extremely good at pricing assets given their risk. So really, it should not matter what I invest in, right? I always get the same return for the risk I take. So I can just invest in a portfolio, just invest in Tesla, just invest in Amazon. I mean, it shouldn't matter, should it? And that is absolutely wrong because you lose out on the gains of diversification. I wanna show you one graph again.
This is the graph I showed you when we talked about mean volatility analysis. And what it shows you is I have five stocks and I form portfolios out of those five stocks. And one portfolio of the five stocks could be, for instance, okay, I only invest in stock one, I don't invest in stock two, I don't invest in stock three, I don't invest in stock four, and I don't invest in stock five. That could be something like I only invest my money into Tesla. And if you do that, you will probably in the diagram land about somewhere here, right? So you would have a volatility of 0.15 and a return of about 9%. So you see, you could have the same volatility and a return of 13% by going into the portfolio, by actually investing into the market portfolio. If you only invest in a single stock, you lose out on the gains on diversification. This is why it can be extremely harmful for you to follow bad investment advice, to overinvest in an asset that is correctly priced. You just lose out on the gains of diversification and you gain nothing. The difference between only investing in one asset that is correctly priced and investing into the market portfolio is this year. It's extremely large. Following bad investment advice can destroy the sharp ratios of your portfolio. And I told you in the Eugene Pharma study, out of the 4,500 mutual fund managers who try to beat the market, 97% of them fail. It's extremely hard to correctly identify the assets which are mispriced. So wrapping up this video, if you wanna make money on a financial market, the easiest way to do it is to say, okay, prices are correct. I'm gonna invest into the market portfolio. I will have an annual return about 8%, annual volatility of about 16%, so I'm fine. The other way you can do is you can try to understand mispricings in the market. But I told you it's extremely hard and it's extremely bold. Saying that you've identified a mispricing means saying that you, that you understand the financial market better than JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Bank of America. And the absolute way not to do it is like the people I've shown you in this video. To say Disney is a great company because they're a large company and they also own a lot of theme parks. Do you really think that the guys at JP Morgan don't know that already? It's obviously baked into the price. So buying a stock because of information that everybody knows anyway is extremely stupid. And I've repeatedly quoted the study of Eugene Pharma saying 97% of professionals in America who try to beat the market actually fail. Because it's so hard. But of course, if 97% fail, there are 3% who actually succeed. And in the next video, we're going to go over those elite 3% and over their strategies to beat the market that actually work.